Welcome to episode 21 of our Walk in My Shoes series for professional advisors. My name is Sophia Sahanek and I'm the Director of Membership and Development here at Philanthropy Impact. If you'd like to learn more about how to become a member or about our training programme, please get in touch. Our email is at the end of the discussion. This episode, we're coming together to discuss the role of private philanthropy and social investment in the arts and the important role professional advisors play in supporting the clients in this area. Making sure the discussion runs smoothly, we have our chair, Matthew Bocock, who is founder and chair of the Beacon Collaborative. And joining him, we welcome Ida Levine, director at the Impact Investment Institute and a trustee of the Royal Academy of Dance, Sir Richard Stilgo, founder of the Orpheus Centre in Surrey, and Paul Callaghan, who is chairman at the Leighton Group. The topic than art, philanthropy and social entrepreneurialism, because it can encompass a multitude of different sins. But... Um, might be worth just thinking for a minute before we go on to ask a few questions of each of the panel what what we mean by the role of art in our society and what and um it was pointed out just beforehand when we were when we were discussing amongst ourselves that we want to talk a little bit about the sort of society we want to build in the future and one art critic back in the 80s said a work of art is a bridge however tenuous from one mind to another and at a personal level it captivates generates curiosity often pleasure as well as creating social bonds, shared experience, communal meaning. In fact, almost all societies beyond the minimum needs of survival create art through stories, myths, painting, dance, music. And it also underlies so much of our education system. Personally, I've been involved in technology companies in the past, and I keep thinking that artists and software <laughs> engineers are remarkably alike. They both have a vision and imagination for what they want to create. And they really don't want anybody to stop them from creating that. And, um, but all of that is based upon imagination. So the sort of society we create, flow, the imagination we create flows through everything we do, including uh, our education system and our economic system. Where would the creative industries be without the imagination that drives them? Another comment I heard, which was, art is what helps make a society from an economy. It's how you can tell that it's worth that building an economy is worthwhile. So against this backdrop, of course, our arts and culture is going through an incredibly traumatic time. And there are all sorts of predictions of doom and gloom. Many organizations will undoubtedly fail. And one of the questions is, is it going to be survival of the fittest or are we going to have to pick winners? Who's going to fail and who are we going to allow to fail and who are we going to back not to fail? And what sort of future cultural landscape do we want? And what's the role of philanthropy in this scenario? At this, at, at this dif difficult time, you know, when theatres are dark and orchestras are silent and festivals are cancelled, how, in, in these difficult times, why would a donor choose to be backing arts organisations rather than homelessness or domestic violence or education issues? Why would they choose to do that instead? So maybe we need some very new approaches, maybe an arts loan bond has been to rebuild our arts and culture creative spirit, a bit like the bonds that were created after the Second World War. And uh, so I'd like to start with Ida and ask, you know, how do you think we can preserve what's valuable and rebuild? Is it just begging for more out of the Chancellor's dwindling purse? Or are there other resources we can call on? So for, thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to say how important art is in our society. Um, I was born in the US, but I'm now British. And I believe it is really one of the centerpieces of British society. It, there is its cultural role, but also its role in commentary and, and its relevance to life. Uh, I would point wonderful who's a principal dancer of the uh, Birmingham Royal Ballet and his friend poet Davy was uh, LeVar a wonderful commentary on um, Black Lives Matter um, probably brought me closer to it than anything else I've seen I think it will have to be the philanthropists um, the government has been uh, on the job and the cultural um, recovery fund. Um, I think most arts organizations are, are making applications, but that's a short-term fix. Philanthropists will have to uh, step in. 
And there's also the role of social entrepreneurship. Uh, I think that there are social businesses there. Uh, you're, we see the, the dance companies, at least in the communities, doing everything from uh, providing dance to people who suffer from Parkinson's disease and alleviating symptoms, if only temporarily, to dance for kids in deprived neighborhoods. And in all these cases, there's a social benefit. So I think, I, I see social businesses, and maybe this is a new way that arts organizations will be able to um, keep themselves going and uh, take on more of a commercial role. Well, I'd be interested to come back in a minute, maybe, to talk a little bit about philanthropy versus social investment, because I know you're also involved in the Social Investment Institute. But for now, let's just um, focus on this issue of the social impact of the arts. So, Richard, I know you've done extraordinary things to use music to improve lives through the Orpheus Trust uh, for 22 years. Can you tell us a little bit about why you did this? And also, how do you know that you've made a difference? Um, before I do that, I mean, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs as a result of COVID. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs further down the line as a result of AI. Artificial intelligence can do almost everything except have an imagination. We have to keep the creative side of the world going because it is the one thing that is going to keep us going as all the sort of mechanical things get taken over by other, other things. Anyway, going back to the Orpheus Centre. The Orpheus Centre started 22 years ago because nobody was doing music and performance with young disabled people. We are in Godston in Surrey. We have 48 students and they stay with us for three years from 19 onwards. And when they leave, they live independently. 83% of them go into their own accommodation, organize their own lives, contribute to their own communities and change the minds of everybody around them. I don't think there's any other disabled college, college for disabled people, doing the same thing with those results. And those results happen because we concentrate on the performing arts and give people the confidence that appearing in public gives you. Thank you, Richard. It's a superb connection between the investment in art and the social return. Oh, yeah, um, I'm, af I'm afraid one of the arguments in its favour is that after these young people leave us, they cost the taxpayer much less money. But unfortunately, we don't make those connections generally, and it's quite rare that you, you see the savings that are created by interventions ever recognized by the savings to the state. But um, that's a different issue. Paul, I know I've, I, I've had the, the great good fortune to visit you in Sunderland to see the way you've catalyzed the regeneration of the city centre, but using culture as the lead rather than well, alongside education, but also the economy. And I remember you saying to me that you feel that culture can lead in placemaking. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've done and maybe you can comment on the role that philanthropy has played? Yes, yes. Thank you, Matthew. Um, what we're trying to do is, is, is placemaking, place shaping, as it were. Um, we're not concentrating on an individual group. We're called concentrating on a place. And this is a place which is like many places in, in parts of Britain, what are sometimes described as the left behind towns and cities. This is places where um, post-industrial development, they've lost their raison d'etre in terms of industry, and we are seeing city centres and town centres hollowed out. That's been exacerbated by decline in retail, uh, values fall, and essentially many of these places, and it's not just Sunderland, I could name dozens in Lancashire and Yorkshire, the West Midlands, where they are not the key cities. It's not the Manchesters or the Leeds who are really suffering. It is the second cities or the third cities or yeah. the second towns. And what happens is that society starts to crumble. You, we have massive uh, unemployment or we have uh, very poor uh, health and we have poverty and particularly and where I, I come from very high child poverty so how, how do you change it well I've, I've been an economist all my life I used to be chair of the regional development agency and you can put money into industries but industries don't often help city centers 
And as you say, my, my view is that the, the way to change a city centre is through, um, through culture. Um, I don't think, I think that the days of big office blocks and the days of giant shopping malls have gone. And I think people will always want to come together to participate, to be entertained and to be educated. And I think that's where the role of culture in city centres and town centres is so important. There's a, there's a very interesting article, uh, paper uh, released today by Arts Council about the role of culture in place shaping. So that's what we've done. Um, we've done it over the last seven or eight years and we start at the bottom going into the poorest communities um, where there was less than 20 or 30 percent um, cultural participation rates and creating culture with them, letting them decide what we should be doing. And we were helped by the Creative People in Places program from Arts Council. But on the back of that, we've now changed the governance structure of culture so we now know how to plan and strategize uh, culture for the future for the long term and we we're making major investments and we, we we've created uh, about 18 to 20 million pounds worth of physical investment in the city center um, that's been helped both by uh, public money uh, lottery money from arts council heritage lottery from some money from the council who realized the importance of this but also from philanthropy from people who recognize what the benefit is to society. It's social, it's economic, it's health, it's educational. And putting money into something that actually can, can affect a place and the, all of the people in that place is a good way to invest. Paul, I'm just gonna pick up on one thing that you once said to me, and I'm gonna paraphrase this and probably get it wrong. It is that you've got to imagine, is that a pint you're drinking by the way? It's uh, Jose, juice, actually, so I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd check. Um, the, it, it was that you have to first of all create the vision. Mm. And I think the philanthropy played a major role in some in creating the vision. Mm. And I think you said something along the lines of don't go applying for programs down in London. You define the vision and then bring the people to, the, to you and show them the vision and they'll adapt the programs to you. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think you actually have to look how place will be rather than how it is or how it has been. And many places in this country see their, their best days in the past. You can go to many places, you know, the Scunthorpes or the Prestons or the Boltons, and they, they talk about how great it was in the 60s and the 70s. Now, if that's how you view your place, You'll, you'll actually never change it for the better. You've got mm -hmm. to say, how's this place going to look in 2030 and 2040 and 2050 so that I build a place for my children and my grandchildren. People want to come there. I use a phrase actually, which is, um, I'm trying to build a place where ta talent wants to live. And I think that's, that's it. Not, not just musical talent or acting talent, but talent in general. People who are talented, whether it's talented with their hands, with their brains, that they want to live in that place because it is a good place. It's an exciting place. And culture, I believe, gives a place its soul. It, it builds in people empathy. It, it changes their life projections, their life uh, trajectories. And therefore, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. And, and you persuade, and it's always persuasion. It's like pitching in business. You pitch an idea and you've got to go and get the money from London or from philanthropists or from trusts and foundations and you've got to tell them this is a good idea. And of course you get momentum. And Once you get one person bought into it, we got Heritage Lottery Fund were the first people to, 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 to buy into us. And they gave us two and a half million. We've then had Arts Council money. We've had trust and foundation money and put money in ourselves. You know, it's a, you, you've, you've got to comp prime these things. But it's, uh, you know, the, the, it's the long-term benefit. You're talking about how you measure this. You measure this in lots of ways. Health, education, prosperity, um, satisfaction. Is this a good place to live? Do you, do you really want to stay here? Richard and, and Ida, do you, want to, do you want to comment on that and, and build on it how in your environment you can make cultural uh, change at the sorry, center? Sorry, Ida, Ida, please do. Uh, I, I can see that culture is a really important part of the leveling up agenda, and yes. um, that's where it should fit in. And the government, I know, is very keen on, on 
spreading out um, some of the prosperity we see in, in, in the South. But um, I think culture has a really important role you know, because it does help build communities and make them places that people want to live. Yes. So I, mm. I, I really I agree with you. I'm, I, I was lucky enough to grow up in Liverpool in the 60s mm. and when suddenly pop music, music of all sorts, gave opportunities to young people, gave Liverpool a chance to hold its head up high. Yeah. And I mean, I guess, yeah, music for young people and sport for young people. Those are the two things that mean a lot in Liverpool. And they are two ways of getting out of poverty, sport and music in that, sa in that same way. It was, it was a really lucky place to grow up and it has attracted so much money into Liverpool as a result, just as a result of the Beatles, bless their hearts, and the mm -hmm. captain. But if that happen, hadn't happened, Liverpool would mm -hmm. be a much sadder place to live now. It would be good if the government spent more time in Sunderland, in Hull, in Liverpool, and gave a higher proportion of the taxpayers' money to those places rather than to London. I, I wonder as well whether in the 1960s, Richard, the... Um, the powers that be, the Arts Council as it was at that time, would have recognising the flowering of arts talent in the, in the form of the Beatles. And no. are we missing the talent no. happening absolutely now? not, no. Uh, then, then the arts were seen very much as high art, high culture, high thing. And one of the nicest developments in my lifetime, which I've been shouting about since I, was, since I could speak, was the recognition of popular culture as being an uplifter just as much as yes. Absolutely, and I think Ida would agree with that when you see how urban dance has had enormous yeah, impact. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, and there's actually evidence that well-being um, is linked to dance and, and other forms of physical activity, but particularly dance. Um, the What Works uh, Well-Being System uh, Center, which is run by Nancy Hay and uh, Gus O'Donnell, has done some research and there's clear evidence that that well-being is created um, by having uh, young people involved with dance. Now, Richard, uh, sorry, there, 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 on, on, on sorry, dance. Yeah. If I can just intervene on dance, I, I see dance as being absolutely fundamental to this. We we do a lot of music, we do drama, but dance. We we converted an old fire station, a 1907 fire station, and we took the firemen's reading room, smoking room, and billiard room. And we converted them into dance studios for Dance City, which is the regional dance organization. They now run hours and hours of dance a week, everything from, from children all the way through to, to uh, adults and, and older people, up to an MA in, in performance. And that is in a place which traditionally, firemen used to spend their time waiting for the bell to ring so they could go down in the pole. And dance is absolutely, you know, it, it is transformational because people actually believe that they can actually go and do it. It's, it's, it's wonderful. But we do that with that dance, we do it with music, we do that with, with writing. And it, it's a combination of things because what you try and do is to reach as many people as you possibly can. And and also, as a result of the work of Ashley Banjo and diversity. Yeah. First, diversity, as you know, is the opposite of university, I'm afraid. As a result of diversity's dance, gosh, you, you should see a group of classical dancers watching a group of street dancers with their mouths open, and also noting that the number of street dancers divides the genders pretty much equally. It's brought so many boys into dance than yeah. before. Yeah, absolutely. Can I just raise one other thing? Because, Richard, you mentioned how there had been uh, a, a boundary disappearing between the uh, between popular culture and high art and how important that was. I think there's another boundary that's disappearing as well and that is between arts and culture being seen as a sector and where different into the creative industries which brings in ways in which a lot of our arts and culture and creativity could be financed commercially rather than through the way we've traditionally done it which is a combination of sort of uh, ticket sales and grant and a certain amount of philanthropy. Ida, do you want to comment on the role of social investment? Well, as I said before, I, um, there are different ways that the arts um, contribute to society and well-being. 
uh, to mental and physical uh, health outcomes that just cry out for a social business uh, to um, to reach out and and create more opportunities for people to be able to benefit in this way. Um, anything from social prescriptions to uh, social businesses that focus on dance, on art. I, I, I think there is an opportunity there where the social outcome, the social impact uh, and the beneficial um, effect of, of these activities is very high. Can I just follow up with one other quick question because I'm picking up on a couple of questions which are coming from the audience or, or, or from the, the, the uh, uh, convener, moderator, and that is, um, what's the role of professional advisors? Because there are probably a number on the call. How can they influence people to be both social investors and philanthropists and givers to the arts to build the new sort of cultural community that we want? I'm interested, Ida, particularly from you. Okay. Um, I'm actually, um, I'm, I've been involved with the ballet world. Um, I've so enjoyed it. And I think that advisors can make sure their clients have the best possible experience. And part of that is by hooking them up with particular programs. Um, and I, I think the social programs are very rewarding. Um, whether it's uh, Royal Academy of Dance has a program called Step In to Dance, which reaches 6,000 kids in London and at Essex, many of them uh, from disadvantaged communities. It's funded by the Jack Petchy Foundation. Uh, there are programs like Step In to Dance, which is street dance. There are programs to get boys into ballet. Um, in fact, there was a joint venture with the Marylebone Cricket Club to get girls into cricket and boys into ballet. There are a, a host of, of, of different programs. Uh, the Northern Ballet uh, does a lot of work in Yorkshire. Uh, and I think what the advisors can do is to hook people up with the right programs to get them excited. And I, I actually think um, people should start their philanthropy journeys when they're younger. And uh, when, so there's an, a next gen element here. And when I was, I was a partner in a law firm and uh, I, I would have loved to have the balance in my life when I was working uh, 2,400 hours a year, um, day and night. Uh, I think it's really, I think advisors can, can play a great role in, in getting uh, people who are still working or people who are recently retired or have sold their businesses into the right organizations and doing some really exciting things. Now, another question which has been asked by uh, one of the attendees, which I'd like to just fire at Richard, and that is that the, a lot of the social impact is well documented and explained by the arts organizations. They spend a lot of time thinking about how they can demonstrate their social impact, but the mainstream media never really picks this up. Indeed, there was an article about philanthropy recently, which was highly critical of the amount of money that goes to the arts, not recognizing that a huge amount of the arts is actually for social purposes. How do we get the mainstream media to understand the role that the arts play in social transformation? One of the, one of the problems with the arts in all its forms is that a lot of practitioners in the arts have a sense of entitlement that the arts must be there, they're obviously good, there's no need to explain it to everybody. There really is a need to explain it to everybody, especially the mainstream media, the effect that it has, the effect that it's doing, what it's doing for young people. I mean, if you're, if you're an advisor advising somebody whose investments you're in charge of, Every single adult in the country is nervous about what is going to happen to the next generation and the generation after that. If you get involved with some of these arts projects with young people and go and watch them, you will see young people succeeding, young people with imagination, young people creating, and it cheers you up no end. There is absolutely no point in doing philanthropy unless it makes you feel better. And by doing it, doing it well in the right places, it, yeah, it makes you sleep better at night. Well, an interesting piece of piece of work, the Beacon Collaborative has been doing some major surveys as to what the barriers are to giving amongst high net worth. And 
one of the questions has been around the extent to which you trust the organizations. And we've been able to do some segmenting of the, of, of, of the data that we've gathered from this big, quite costly survey that we've done. We discovered that people that give to the arts trust the organizations they give to much more than a lot of other people, a lot of other sectors. What does that say? Maybe it's because you actually get involved with the organization, you get reward out of it, you get pleasure out of it. Even if you're funding, you know, the work of an art organization with prisoners, you may not get to go and visit them in the prison, but you see the organization and you get personal reward from it. So I would say that actually engagement with arts organizations that are doing social activity is social impact work is probably one of the most rewarding forms of philanthropy. It isn't just about being able to dress up in a black tie and go to the opening night. No, can I come in on that one? I, I think a, a lot of giving, whether it's from philanthropists or from uh, the public purse, is about trust. It's about the, the organisation that is getting the money has to deliver what it says it's going to do. and It's got to do it in the right way. And therefore, what we've tried to do is to involve other organizations who have similar views. Now that's universities and college and the, the local authority who all understand the, the, the basis of this. And then people can trust, they, they've seen how universities develop, they've seen how colleges develop. Now they're seeing how they're coming together as a, as a cultural driver. And places like Sunderland or Stokes, a fantastic example, I know Matthew, you're, you're involved with what's happening there, where the universities, uh, people like the YMCA, the, uh, the local authorities come together and say this will actually change our place and trust us if you make some investment, whether that's commercial investment, social investment or philanthropic investment, then you can actually make a difference. Thank you, Paul. I see John has joined us, which is usually a sign that we're just coming to the very end. You're the harbinger of doom at the <laughs> end of the call, John. So uh, over to you. Oh, that's nice. <clears throat> Don't think I've been called that for a while. Um, thank you. Um, that was a brilliant start. <coughs> Excuse me. What I'd like to do is actually to do a full webinar on this topic because I think we just barely scratched the surface. I mean, to, I'd like to learn more about really what motivates all, all of you for getting involved in this um, and what your journey's been. So these are the kinds of things I think we could um, develop more. Um, I'd like to ask each one of you uh, 30 seconds, final words of, of wisdom. Um, so I'll start with Paul. <laughs> um, 30 words, 30 seconds of wisdom. I, I think culture is fundamental to society and impacts on so many aspects of society. And if we don't value and invest in culture, then we actually undermine our future and our children's future. Thank you, Ida. I would agree with that. And uh, culture is such a big part of our lives and we would lose so much joy and satisfaction if we didn't have it. And it can help others and we need to make sure that we reach out and we let other people who may have less advantages have, have this wonderful benefit. Thank you. Richard. For potential philanthropists, you got rich by making choices, by making better choices than other people. Philanthropy gives you a chance to go on making better choices than the government would otherwise make if you let all your money go to the government in taxation. The arts is, the arts is the best two ends of the spectrum, the warmth of infrared, the calm of that, and the excitement of ultraviolet. Without it, it's just the colors you can see. Thank you. Richard. We really should have let Richard go last, so I didn't have to follow that wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Richard, you're going to get a second act then. Okay, Matthew. <laughs> Um, we, we all share the same view, which is the extraordinary impact that arts, can, that, that arts can provide. But I think maybe we need to start opening our minds to a completely different world. How do we make philanthropy more naturally part of what everybody here does? It isn't just for rich people. Everybody can be engaged in, in philanthropy and participate in ways of funding things and knowing where it's going and, and, and its impact. And how do we also make the arts and culture part of everybody's lives? And we don't separate out groups and say, oh, well, that, uh, that 
you know, that rock music doesn't belong in high art in the same way as street dance doesn't necessarily belong. And how do we make sure the creative industries regard themselves as an extension so that in the future, uh, everybody's imagination drives the sort of country that we live in? Thank you. Matthew, someone has asked a question about where they can get that research report. I, can I assume that they can get it on the Beacon Collaborative website? Either the Beacon Collaborative web, website or we did it in partnership with the Institute for Fundraising and there's, an, and there's a whole set of underlying data so we will be producing more reports. For example, how the arts and culture sector varies from other sectors in how people give as we start to unpick the data behind it. Okay. Uh, Richard, would you like to have the final, final, final word? <laughs> I've just, I've, it has been thrilling to be part of this. Thank you very much, all of the other participants. Um, this is so important, otherwise life is so dull. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Paul, for participating. And hopefully uh, we can do a follow-up session together. I think it'd be terrific. So thank you very much. By the way, somebody has just posted, consider bunches of roses thrown up onto the stage. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.